I am so delighted to see you again, Nada. I, last time I saw you was in, seems like ages ago, in, uh, in Oxford, I believe, for school. So um, thanks for joining, thanks for participating, and great to see you again. Yes, absolutely. It's uh, always good to see you and uh, to discuss with you. In fact, we had a very interesting conversation in Oxford, and uh, I hope that we can continue. We did well. Let's not. We can hope to continue, but we can also continue, and that'll be part yeah. of this that we're that we're doing right now. And um, I think a great place to start, of course, would be if you could formally introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about you. That would be really valuable. Yes, um, my name is Nada Mazdalani. I'm the Palestinian director of EcoPeace Middle East uh, organization. Uh, EcoPeace, uh, for those who uh, are not familiar with it, is a regional organization uh, based in Palestine, Israel, and Jordan. And our main mission and focus is on environmental peace building. And you've got, um, you've got an interesting background, um, I would say, pretty highly focused in environment, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, so um, my connection with environmental issues came early at an early stage when I was at school. Uh, I've been involved in environmental activities and uh, extracurricular uh, programs. Um, I've been also put into summer camps addressing uh, transboundary environmental and water issues. So I grew up actually with the slogan of environment and water knows no boundaries. As you can imagine, a teenager who is brought up on these concepts uh, and ideas uh, keeps things somewhere in the you know, back of the consciousness. Um, so uh, I studied uh, biology uh, as a BA uh, and my master's was in environmental assessment and management uh, from the UK. And um, when I came back uh, to Palestine after my master's, I worked in several um, organizations and programs re uh, related to uh, um, infrastructure, environmental protection, uh, water uh, provision, and so forth. Um, but it has always been you know, in the back of my mind uh, that uh, there's something more to give to, um, uh, to the environment uh, from not only from a perspective of uh, hardcore technical issues. Um, I still believed in the slogan that I've learned during my uh, teenage times. Uh, and I uh, reached out several times, in fact, to uh, hopefully get a chance to work for EcoPeace. Um, back then, uh, I've, I knew very well the former uh, uh, director in Palestine. Unfortunately, there was no room to accommodate me at that uh, time. Uh, but um, I don't know, years passed and I evolved. Uh, I got more experience. Uh, an opportunity was there to actually apply and become uh, a director here. And uh, it's just like a dream came true. That's, that's, that's pretty awesome. You, you've kind of answered one of my next questions, but I'm going to ask it again. Um, you know, people talk about what their, what their why is all the time, what their purpose is. And um, tell me, why, why do you do what you do? Well, um, first of all, I did tell you the first part, which is the subconsciousness. But the second part and the, fur the more I grow up and the more I get also more aware of my surroundings and the consequences, and particularly for a Palestinian who is, um, you know, living under uh, harsh conditions because of the, uh, of the conflict and because of the restrictions uh, of the military control over the Palestinian territories, uh, I find myself obliged to uh, basically get involved in uh, in such a uh, a motion and uh, uh, an organization because I not only address peace building and environmental issues, I for for me as a Palestinian, I also address national self interest. 
for uh, um, righteous access to water, um, righteous um, access to proper services and, and, uh, and uh, resources and uh, facilities that would enable uh, the Palestinian people to have uh, appropriate life conditions uh, in the context of a prosperous region. I, I, I'm not here only speaking of a Palestinian self-interest, but positioning ourselves in uh, a regional context that shares interests to prosper and grow together in a sustainable way. Yeah, you see, I, I, that's one of the things that caught my attention when I first met Gidon and then when I met uh, you all at, at Oxford. It's, it's, um, it's about water management, but it's about more than just this water and, and environment. And, um, and as we see, even with the, the craziness of a coronavirus, um, and we talked about this a little bit, th there's no boundaries there. Um, what, what's on one side of a border impacts the other side of the border. And, and um, all anybody wants in the world, in fact, they say the number one thing that fills people's hearts and souls is to belong to belong in community. Um, with that, what's been maybe your biggest challenge? And on the other side, what's been most memorable for you in being involved in, in Eco Peace? Um, uh, let's, uh, let's speak about the challenge first mm -hmm. uh, and then the memorable uh, event. <laughs> the most, <laughs> the most, I guess, challenging is um again how we are operating within all this crazy situation that has gone for decades and decades of things not going the right way that we really wanted for our people it's uh it's it's the conflict that is also impeding our ability to work as a homogeneous group um, towards a better life for us all. So as much as we try to engage with, uh, with our uh, communities, with our stakeholders, we, we empower their voices and we discuss with them the importance of cooperation on environmental and water issues, there remains the impediment of, um, uh, of being accused by um, as being and you know uh, uh, normalizers, normalizers with the enemy, uh, uh, collaborating with uh, with the enemy, uh, treason, and whatsoever you name it. This is one of the perhaps most difficult moments that we would face at you know um, at at the time what, where we're trying to do things uh, that we believe. Uh, are proper, but they are against the currents that are surrounding us at the moment. Um, uh, however, I think the most memorable time uh, for me would be uh, when uh, Gidon and I, uh, the Israeli director, uh, spoke um, um, and addressed the uh, UN Security Council. Uh, we, we gave a speech from deep from the heart, uh, and, uh, it's not only emotional that is deep from the heart, but it's also based on evidence, mm -hmm. based on facts that we cannot disengage from our shared environment. Um, at that speech in front of this room full of leaders and you know, world scale decision makers, uh, Gidon and I sat there and we gave that speech and surprisingly, the Palestinian ambassador to the UN and the Israeli ambassador to the UN both thanked us for the speech that we gave. This is rather exceptional because you would not easily find that an organization that has a Palestinian Israeli element uh, gets uh, recognized at least by a thank you um, to uh, basically um, 
uh, from 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 uh, from the ambassadors or decision makers of our two uh, conflicting countries. So for me, that was uh, really a memorable time. That um, I I really hope that it won't be the 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 first and the last. But I think all throughout the journey of Ecopeace. Um, there's, I think every moment and every minute and every activity is memorable and worthwhile and valuable. Um, and we, we all, as leadership, as staff, we all cherish these moments. Every time we work together and we make even the tiniest achievements that we make. Yeah, because tiny achievements turn into two, uh, big accomplishments. Actually, yes. and um, you know, and full disclosure, I'm a, a Canadian American Jewish guy, and um, I so admire, which is why I loved when I heard about Eco Peace. Um, you know, it reminds me of my grandparents, and I'm sure everybody's grandparents probably say the same thing. But my grandparents, with a, a Kiev accent, always used to say, you know, as long as you have your health, that's the most important thing. You know, yes. and and then they say, and then after that is education, but. Everything you're doing is about well-being, is about, is about health, and it's the most important thing. And it doesn't distinguish between a um, person from, you know, Jordan to Palestine to Israel to Canada to U.S., whatever. It just, like the coronavirus is teaching us, just hits across. And we're all, we're all in the same league, if I compare it to sports. We're all in the same one planet. Um, with respect to that, so many things are happening technologically so fast. You've got coronavirus, you've got injustices that are coming up, obviously, here in the States and now around the world for all sorts of things. Um, so people are thinking a little bit more. People have a little more time to think what's really important in their yeah. lives and values, which goes back to my grandparents saying that. And how do you view, then, the, the future of, of collaboration? I'm not trying to get you to solve world peace here, but, but collaboration, including where we're business leaders, business leaders who care, which is what we're talking about, recognizing leaders who care, can actually engage and support what you're doing beyond water, maybe into other areas like solar and whatnot, and just collaboration of, you know, we are one planet. Yeah. So um, the, the, the future of, uh, indeed, you, you brought in, I'm going to go back to this, uh, you brought into the conversation the pandemic uh, and how it has actually changed things. Uh, and absolutely, throughout this pandemic, we have really recognized how, um, again, it's very difficult to disengage uh, from our uh, shared reality and shared environment. Um, and at that point, uh, we had really high hopes that um, a collaboration that we have seen on the level of uh, public health, on the level of exchanging information, of uh, facilitating the works of the public health workers and medical staff um, would basically advance uh, opening our eyes uh, to the importance of really addressing other transboundary issues, uh, in particular uh, environmental issues and climate change. Climate change is uh, yet another global threat which requires the attention of all people regardless of their location. Uh, and therefore, um, we do indeed envision that uh, we can certainly learn uh, from the experience during the uh, pandemic. Um, and learn from uh, the failure of uh, some of the elements that has not enabled appropriate uh, collaboration. Um, and to learn to address them and to, to, uh, to bring out solutions uh, to, to make the possibilities and potentials for collaboration uh, better. Um, for for Ecopeace, when we address the uh, large the larger picture of uh, climate change and cooperation um, on the levels of of course also water and energy, we've come out uh, with a, a concept that is called the water and energy nexus uh, that came out 
in 2017 uh, through a pre-feasibility study that is based on the coal and steel agreement uh, that brought out the European Union from the ashes of World War II uh, towards a more cohesive system uh, that shares prosperity. Uh, in that concept, we literally, uh, as you've mentioned, um, envisioned that it is not the job of Ecopeace to foster this cooperation. It's not the job also of the government to foster this cooperation. It rather needs to be done through uh, business leaders and the business communities and uh, uh, supported then by a regulatory atmosphere that needs to be created by the government. Um, with this, Ecopeace looks at the exchange of water and energy across the borders and on both sides of the Jordan River as a potential leverage for building trust and uh, improving cooperation on other sectors, not only on water and energy, but to basically foster trust and facilitate uh, further um, um, uh, talks and collaboration towards uh, perhaps creating stability uh, and security uh, preservation uh, throughout the region. Now, is that, are you getting and are you looking and getting engagement with with business leaders who care about this? Absolutely, we are engaging with our authorities and with our business leaders. Uh, we are uh, engaging with champions who would uh, potentially be um, engaged in whatever pilot project uh, we will uh, implement to basically prove the concept. We need um, leaders who come bluntly and bold saying that this is the way to move forward uh, and this is what we're actually working now at the moment. That's great. Well, I'm going to now welcome in a friend of yours. Hello, hello. Hello, hello to you. I feel that we know each other. We've met. We have met. We met in Oxford. Okay. Yes, yes, which, yes. Which seems like nine Oh, so Great to see you again then. Yes, no kidding. It's like a long time. Um, it seems like forever. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was a great meeting and I was so happy that we were able to, to do that. And in fact, at that time, um, was it Narit? Was she with you as, as well? Dalit was with us. It was Nada, myself and Dalit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was great to see you all. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm so happy to see that you're, you're doing great stuff and then to be able to shine a little light on this, you know, through our, through our series as well. So this would be a great time. Uh, Yana, to, um, if you could just like formally introduce yourself and, and tell everybody a little bit about you before we get going. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm Yana Abu Talib. I am the Jordanian co-director of Ecopeace Middle East. Um, I've been with the organization for uh, the past, uh, uh, for more than 10 years, continuously for the past 10 years. Um, and that's a sign. Uh, a sign that uh, how much I really um, uh, committed and uh, enjoy doing what I do, basically. And um, tell us a little bit about your background. It's it's um, it's interesting. You've been there continually for ten years, and I, I love the sound of, of pride in that statement. Tell us a little bit about about your background and how you. Um, well, let's start a little bit about your background. Well, okay, so um, uh, I studied at the University of Jordan mm -hmm. and I studied archaeology, which is interesting because people ask me, oh, wow, archaeology and how come you're working in the environmental peace building field? Um, so I never practiced really archaeology, uh, but it's something that is linked to, uh, uh, it has that human aspect. And in a way, it's, it's, some, uh, it's something I, I also uh, am passionate for uh, as well. Um, but I really never practiced. Um, so uh, I decided that uh, after doing a different uh, um, um, jobs, let's say, um, that I have passion for as well, um, I, but I didn't feel I belonged. 
mark in that sense until I uh, was introduced to Ecopeace. And this is where I felt, oh my God, I can't believe that such an organization exists. And that's what I really want to be doing. Was that literally, you said, oh my God? <laughs> I did say, oh my God, I did, I did. Because I never thought, you know, that such an organization would, be, would exist in our part of the world. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what impressed me the most um, is, is what you're doing and the, sim the symbolism and the actual great work that you're doing at the same time, I think are, are both super important. And um, you kind of answered this a little bit, but I'd like to get a little, maybe even a little deeper as, you know, everybody talks about their why or their purpose. And I'd like to know, why do you do what you do? I thought about it, Mark, and uh, I really am doing what I'm doing because of passion. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate to peace building. Um, I felt that I was born with it in that sense. But I also feel that um, we need to, uh, we need that change in our region. And we have the people that can uh, make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so they're linked in that way. But it, I mean, um, um, it is out of passion. Yeah, that, that's great. How did you come to, well, 10 years ago, that was before Gidon, I believe, right? Or was it when you joined? Well, I rejoined in 2010, early 2010. Okay. But I was working with the organization back in 2000 uh, until 2003. Um, so that's why I say, I'm saying uh, a little bit more than 10 years, basically. And um, how I joined, it was by full coincidence. So I know the previous uh, former director, Jordanian director, mm -hmm. and uh, we both have a passion for aviation as well. Um, so uh, one day he came to me. Um, uh, I didn't know that he was also uh, co-directing. Uh, eco piece and there was a job opening at uh, and I was ready to leave my uh, uh, previous job at uh, one of the local airlines here in uh, in Amman um, and he said to me why don't you come and join uh, an organization that I'm heading and I was just stunned to, to hear from him and I was like, I lit literally said, oh my God, and how come I don't know that you're managing such an organization? <laughs> and this is where it started, believe it or not, you know? Um, as um, if I remember correctly, I started with uh, editing uh, the newsletter hmm. that EcoPeace uh, was publishing. That's, that's, that's great. It's amazing how things evolve. Um, how... how well, let me ask you, what, what do you think has been the biggest challenge? Start with the biggest challenge you've had and then leading towards what might be the, the most memorable. Okay. So the biggest challenge has really um, uh, many challenges, but the I biggest uh, uh, challenge is that I always felt that I'm going against the mainstream. Um, so the vast majority of, of Jordanians, Mark, are uh, against cooperation. Um, and if you think of it in that sense, there are very few that understand um, uh, the need for cooperation. But um, there are even fewer people who are willing to do something about it. So, I mean, imagine that. Um, I always felt that because I mean it's it's we're in a conflict area and I keep saying that it's the mother of all conflicts um, but then you you have we have so much work that we need to to do to enable us to move forward with small steps but then you're going against you know the majority um, so that has been really um, the main challenge let's say that I've been facing um, memorable i thought about that but every second of my work with the organization has been memorable um from you know building projects to our internal team meetings to our uh, directors meetings to holding events trips there's a memory in everything 
and even in the challenges, you know, um, there's a memory in everything that we uh, that we did and do. That's where your passion comes into play. It's like starting a a startup, <clears throat> and when you're doing a startup, you're working all the time, and the only way you're going to make it happen is if you thrive on those every minute of challenges, um, thrive on the journey. Um, it, it's so important. Otherwise, you get you get burnt out, and and then definitely keeps you keeps you going. You know, I do understand that there are other opportunities aside from water, like solar power and different things going on where Jordan is, is actively involved in, in that part. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, definitely. Um, but before that, I mean, we, I know that we are, uh, as an organization, our main focus is on uh, uh, shared water uh, resources. And uh, um, uh, but again, water, I see water as a bridge to other issues that we need to be cooperating on. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, water management, you really need to address sustainable agriculture, uh, technology transfer, um, and build healthy independency in that sense. Um, so I feel that uh, the major two uh, cooperation issues that are uh, uh, our strength at this time is the Jordan Valley Master Plan, Mm -hmm. um, that was created around uh, rehabilitating the Jordan River, but achieving sustainable development uh, uh, objectives as well. Um, and, and, and working together um, in the three countries to implement the projects identified in that master plan, but also being creative in how we uh, implement the project. So we don't put um, all the load, let's say, on the government to initiate projects or, or focus only on leveraging uh, donor money. But we also look at including the private sector, let's say, in um, uh, contributing to, uh, to the projects on ground. Um, so that's one of the, the strengths or the projects uh, that we're working on. But the other is the water energy nexus. Because what we're doing is building on the comparative advantages of each of the countries in the region and building healthy interdependency. Because we thought about it for a long time and being experienced on ground, seeing realities and how things evolve on ground, um, we needed to really look at what's going, what's happening to, to the arrangements at this time between the three countries. So we, we looked at the water arrangement and how Jordan is purchasing addi its additional needed quantities of water from Israel, Israel being number uh, one in the world in terms of desalination technology, um, and thinking how we can create a better uh, partnership between the countries. So from there, building on the comparative advantage of Jordan, having uh, vast areas of uh, uh, ecologically insignificant, let's say, uh, desert areas that mm -hmm. can be the regional hub to, uh, to implement solar uh, energy projects for its own, to meet its own demand, but also to meet the demand of, the, uh, of Israel and Palestine in that sense. Yeah, you see, that's what I find it fascinating is, um we're not going to solve world peace in, in this conversation, but um, the opportunity for business leaders or business leaders who care about um, the water management, about other energy, about also that economic interdependence or economic dependence can lead to peace because you care about the, you know, your interdependent to, to make these things happen. So there is a definite connection there. Um, are, are, are business leaders collaborating, participating, and seeing that, that, um, that, that benefit both business-wise and community-wise? They're definitely very interested. We have uh, business leaders from the three countries and internationally that are really supporting that vision of a water energy nexus and for uh, implementing the projects, uh, uh, regional projects identified in the master plan. Um, so for all initiatives, because they understand that our power is together. 
we our businesses can only strive if we really and and make so much more income for everyone if we're working together right um so there's a lot of support and a lot of engagement from uh uh private businesses for the uh, initiatives that's fantastic to hear because i think um at the end of the day it's it's business leaders coming together who care and then Maybe as Jerry Seinfeld said once, it's a little comedy and levity uh, between all of us also to, uh, to realize that we're, um, not to sound cliche-ish, we're all in this together, basically. Definitely, definitely. And this is what our work does, uh, Mark. At some point, we feel that on all levels that we're working on, you know, uh, be it the youth uh, sector, be it the um, the different uh, business, uh, 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 private businesses, let's say, or the government as well. Um, they come to realize that we have so much in common and so much to gain if we're working together. Um, so, yeah. So when does, uh, when does everybody all jump in the water together, the Jordan River? When they feel and understand that it's, it's the only way forward. And we've done it a couple of times. <laughs> so they do understand that we need to be working together. Um, but it, it's not easy because it has to be the right atmosphere. And sometimes, well, most often, and especially at this time, the political atmosphere, unfortunately, does not allow. Um, but people are, especially people who under uh, who have worked with us, became to understand and support our work, uh, they're willing. They're willing to engage. They're willing to, uh, um, um, with the right uh, atmosphere, continue to work. That's great. Um, thank you so much for participating. Um, I'm going to bring Gidon in, hopefully here, in a second. Good Let's... seeing you again. How you doing, Mark? You too. Even though we may not be talking all the time, we're always together. That's that's a good feeling. <laughs> it is a good feeling. Uh, that's the, as I say all the time, I've, I've read studies on it. The thing that fills our hearts and souls more than anything is, is belonging to, to a community. And um, that's one of the things that I've always been really excited about when I first heard about your, um, what you're doing. I mean, you're doing amazing stuff and uh, in a world that needs amazing stuff. So let's start with, uh, for those who may not, this is like Guidon, the sequel or something from a few years ago when we first did this. Um, but um, can you formally introduce yourself and tell a little bit about your background? Sure, so um, my name is Gidon Bromberg and I'm the Israeli co-director of Ecopeace Middle East. In fact, I've been the Israeli co-director since its founding uh, uh, for the last 25 years. Um, I, uh, uh, as a uh, as a teenager, already wanted to contribute to peace building mm -hmm. uh, in Israel and the region, and um, and was looking for the opportunity of how to do that. I, I I was born in Israel, grew up in Australia, but came back to Israel with peace building in mind, and uh, was fortunate to have the opportunity to um, uh, to be offered a scholarship at American University in Washington D.C. in ninety three ninety four. And uh, that was the, at the time of the uh, peace treaty negotiations between Israel and Jordan and uh, the signing of the uh, Oslo Accords between uh, Israelis and Palestinians. And uh, as part of my uh, master's in international environmental law, I asked the question, would uh, uh, peace be good for the environment? And my research concluded that, well, apart from a little bit of lip service, uh, environment was on the peace agenda. And, and one of the conclusions of my uh, thesis were that, well, perhaps if environmentalists, Israeli, Palestinian, Jordanian, at that time also Egyptian, could come together, maybe we could make sure as a civil society organization to put the environment on the agenda so that peace would not only be peace between people, but also peace uh, with our uh, shared environment, with our nature. And I was fortunate enough to, um, uh, to implement you know, the, uh, the recommendation of my thesis. And uh, within um, a few weeks, I uh, met up with some individuals in Washington and asked them, would they fund the first ever 
gathering of environmentalists uh, from the region that would include Israelis. And uh, I managed to convince uh, one particular individual that said, you know what, if you can organize it, I'll fund it. It was only $20,000. And uh, uh, on the second day of, of that meeting that took place at the, uh, in December 1994, uh, the decision was made to create EcoPeace. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And they said it couldn't be done, right? <laughs> hey, well, in, in fact, some of them uh, came to me and said, uh, you know, some of the people that I met, uh, some of the people that I met um, uh, uh, said to me, uh, get on, you know, come back when you're a little bit older. Um, uh, you know, th this creating a regional organization is going to take tremendous experience and, and you're too young. Well, you know, and in, in partly my line of work where um, I, I work with a lot of executives and, and, um, and, and, and put people in the right positions and, and, and whatnot, um, there's a big difference between years of experience and experiences that you've had. And I think um, that, that's, that should be a big, a big distinction. You know, um, there's some 15 year old geniuses that can do great stuff too. And so um, discrimination doesn't work in any aspect, actually, um, <laughs> at all for anybody. Um, um, you kind of told how you've become, you became interested in this. I want to know just briefly, like way back when, growing up, I mean, were you, were you, you know, picking up um, and doing recycling as a little kid? Were you, what were you, what were you thinking back when, back younger days? I mean, you weren't thinking of being the director of Eco Peace Middle East. What were you thinking? So, um, you know, as I said, I grew up in Australia and my parents were fortunate to have a farm in the countryside. Mm -hmm. So most weekends and all summer, we'd spend time in the countryside. So I got a, a very strong appreciation of nature. Um, that, I, I think, uh, led me to being active on environmental issues as a teenager. And I, I participated in, in, a, in a demonstration to save a third of Tasmania. Uh, uh, by stopping uh, the building of a dam uh, in a wilderness area. And that was a, um, a life-changing experience for me. I was perhaps 17 years old. I went on my own and uh, it was my first time traveling out of state. Um, and, I, uh, and, and I discovered that uh, you know, activism can really change things on the ground. And, and, and there was a combination there. On the one hand, we were thousands of uh, university of, of, young, of young people uh, from coming from around Australia to demonstrate. But at the same time, there was a legal action at, in court. And it was really what I saw was the combination of good science, activism, and legal action that, that actually saved a third of Tasmania until today. And, and, and that, that, that experience at, at quite a, a young age um, uh, really formed um, uh, you know, my worldview that an individual can make a difference. In fact, every one of us can make a difference and have the, have the responsibility to make the difference. Yeah, I, I agree. Every, you know, so often people like to, to say, well, how am I going to solve, like solving world peace? How am I going to solve this whole thing? And the problem then is you don't do anything versus if, you know, several millions and millions and hundreds of millions and billions of people did one thing a day, what could happen, right? What could happen uh, in, in the energy and, and, and uh, of the world and, the, and, and one community, basically. Um, so that kind of leads me to um, a couple of things. What do you think has been the biggest challenge um, as you've grown? Let's start with that and then move towards what do you think has been the most memorable? So the biggest challenge for EcoPeace is, is that we're in a state of war. Um, you know, the organization has survived the Second Intifada, uh, Lebanon wars, Gaza wars, terrible violence, um, uh, bloodshed. Um, that, that, that challenge challenges our work every day. We need to wake up the next morning when you know, everything around us looks like it's destroyed, relations have been destroyed. Um, uh, a communication have, have come to a close and somehow develop a strategy that, that, that keeps our issues on the table, that gives hope. And, and, and 
a, a, a tremendous challenge you know, beyond the violence for the organization is to um, uh, 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 develop mechanisms, work programs that, that bring hope back to our peoples, that, that, that a better future does await for us, um, that, that we are capable of living together um, in, uh, in security, in justice, um, in, in a manner um, uh, where there's mutual respect. And, and you know, th this constant uh, violence and, uh, and, and voices of anger uh, uh, are a tremendous challenge in our work. Um, and, and, you know, as we go through those challenges, of course, the, the most wonderful, you know, positive and, and, and motivating aspect of our work um, is the success that we've achieved despite those challenges. Right. So, you know, you know, at Equipeace, we stopped the wall being built um, uh, and preserving uh, what became uh, to be registered as a world heritage site between Israel and Palestine. Um, we uh, convinced uh, our governments to allow fresh water to flow again down the River Jordan, where it hadn't flown, it hadn't flowed for 49 years. We helped uh, uh, bring investments and uh, uh, finalizing the first modern sewage treatment plant in, in Gaza, um, which has helped advance water and sanitation security for not only 2 million people in Gaza, but for the whole region. Um, so, so we have, we have you know, lots of success that, that uh, we can speak to, uh, but perhaps the issue that, that keeps me the most motivated and inspired is seeing the change of attitude, mm -hmm. um, uh, mostly with young people. Um, that, that's what I get the most satisfaction from. Right. When, because, because I really feel that young people have open minds. Um, they're willing to listen. Um, uh, they're, 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 they're not satisfied with the status quo, right. almost by definition. Right. And, 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 and therefore, you know, all the stereotypes um, are, are relatively easy to overcome with young people. And then you see the coin drop um, you know, with the understanding that you know, the political borders are man-made. Uh, perhaps the most important borders are nature's borders, are our watershed. And you know, if we're going to protect our watershed, then clearly we need to work with everyone that lives in that watershed. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's brilliant. And it kind of leads to, you know, um, economic interdependence, the same way, in, you know, environment and peace come together, as you said, economic interdependence you know, certainly doesn't hurt having peace also, if nothing else, that you, wow, I can actually work with, with these people. Um, um, how are you finding collaboration between business leaders who care? Because we're finding very much that it really is up to a lot of business leaders to care about the well-being of community um, in general, which includes water, energy, etc. How are you finding collaboration and interest in that is good for business and it's good for community to be involved. Absolutely. So, so at Equipeace, we, we uh, uh, program our activities reaching out to the business community. We, we well understand that the business community tends to be very rational, um, uh, you know, less emotional. Sadly, much of our region here is so over emotional. Uh, but the business community is very rational. They very, under, they very well understand that uh, working together makes business sense and taking care. So this is not across the board, but, but the more progressive businesses also understand that taking care of the environment also makes uh, a, a critical business sense. So, so we reach out. In fact, we've developed a, a, a program that we're extremely excited about, which is um, uh, a water energy nexus. So it's actually taking the experience of Europe in, in creating a coal and steel agreement after World War II and mm -hmm. understanding that the coal and steel of the Levant that's relevant for this century is actually harnessing the sun and the sea. And, that, and that's, that's all uh, being done uh, presently through the business community. The business community is heavily invested today 
in uh, uh, green, in solar uh, energy production. Um, the business community is heavily inv invested in desalination. What's unique about our work is to put those players together, to, to bring together those investors, particularly in Jordan, which has the ca comparative advantage to, because of its vast desert areas, mm -hmm. to produce large scale renewable and, and sell that electricity to Israel and Palestine and then work with the business community in Israel, which is already heavily invested in desalination, uh, more interest in Gaza for desalination, use renewable energy coming from Jordan to desalinate and then sell water back. And we see the excitement and the leadership of the business community. Uh, they will play, they are playing a critical role in helping us create the political will needed from our governments to see that a healthy interdependency actually created on the ground. Yeah, I think, I think that's fantastic, that, uh, which is why we, we're doing this whole series about leaders who care, where you can actually care and still have a profitable business at the same time. So I think you're, you're leading a great, a great effort. Mm -hmm.